As co-presidents of the Phoenix chapter, Linda Ullman and I would like to welcome alumni, parents, BNC members, and friends to this informative session with Paul Rockauer. Thank you to BNC National, Beth Bernstein and Alex Glomset and Idella Ashley for partnering with our chapter. Please put your questions at the bottom um, and Linda Ullman is now going to introduce our guest speaker, Paul Rockauer. Good morning, everybody. I want to introduce Paul Rockauer. We're very excited to have him. I'm going to read a little bit of a, a brief um, bio on him and then I'm going to let him take it away because he's really the one that's going to tell us everything about himself. So Paul Rockauer is the Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Phoenix. He's formally the Executive Director of Levantine Public Diplomacy, an independent public diplomacy organization. He's managed the U.S. Department of State's American Music Abroad and Next Level programs in dozens of countries around the world, including many countries in conflict. He also previously worked with the Israel, Israeli Foreign Ministry. Paul is a Brandeis alum who graduated in 2003 with a BA in Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies, and he has wonderful things to say about Brandeis, and we're, we welcome you all, and take it away, Paul. Thanks. There's a race of men that don't fit in, a race that can't sit still. So they break the hearts of kith and kin and roam the world at will. They climb, they range the field and rove the flood. They climb the mountain's crest. Theirs is the curse of nomad's blood and they don't know how to rest. If they just went straight home, they might go far. They are strong and brave and true, but they're always tired of the things that are and they want the strange and new. It's a poem by Robert Service. It was featured in uh, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood and really speaks to uh, a nomadic existence. And I've, I've lived a bit of a nomadic existence uh, doing public diplomacy, basically public diplomacy night errantry all over the world. I've been to almost 85 countries. I've worked in over 30 countries. I've worked with the State Department. I've worked with the Israeli Foreign Ministry. I've worked in India with the Indian Ministry of External Affairs. And I've worked uh, in Taiwan running public diplomacy programs all over. And to get a sense of, of how nomadic my life has been, before I moved to Phoenix um, about 18 months ago, I had been without a fixed address for almost seven years while I was running State Department cultural diplomacy programs. And during that seven years, I didn't live anywhere longer than two months. The longest I lived anywhere was in Paris for two months and in Morocco for two months. But literally I was continent hopping, I was country hopping, running different cultural diplomacy programs for the State Department, of which I'll talk a bit about that during this discussion. And, and mind you, I didn't have a smartphone then. I, I didn't have a smartphone until I moved to Phoenix 18 months ago. I, I was actually, I have to say, I was much happier without having a smartphone uh, traveling all, all about. But I, I've traveled from Beijing to Cairo, writing about Jewish communities in far-flung places. I've traveled from LA to Panama by bus. I've truly been a nomad, and I'm going to share a bit of some of my adventures with all of you here. I'd like to thank uh, BNC Phoenix for, for hosting me, for having me. Um, I would like to point out I'm, I'm speaking in a personal capacity as a Brandeis alumni. Um, so this is an audience I, I assume is savvy enough to understand that what that means. To get everyone on the same page uh, with what I'm going to be discussing in terms of public diplomacy, Professor Rockauer is going to give you a little bit of a background about what is public diplomacy. So first and foremost, you have to understand the difference between diplomacy and public diplomacy. Diplomacy is very high level, very secretive. It's, it's the communication of government to government. This is you know, how governments function and communicate directly. Public diplomacy is the antithesis of this. It is how countries or communities communicate with people with foreign publics. They, it's how countries or communities communicate their policies, their culture, and their values. Public diplomacy is really the intersection of communication and foreign policy, or in, in a communal sense, you know, of domestic public policy. And so public diplomacy really um, rests on five pillars. First and foremost is the, the notion of listening. You have to listen to your audience. You have to understand you know, the language to speak. You have to understand what, what, how your audience ticks. So first and foremost, you have to engage in, in listening to your audience. It, it deals with advocacy, strategic communication, information, how you communicate information internationally. 
Uh, another pillar of public diplomacy is cultural exchange. We're going to talk a bit about that today. Um, cultural exchange being things like study abroad, Fulbright programs, uh, the Rotary Foundation does a lot of cultural exchange. I'm going to talk a little bit about a program that I did with the Rotary Foundation. Uh, Seeds of Peace is a good example of, of cultural exchange. I'll talk a little bit about that because I spent summer working at Seeds of Peace. Um, what I, I spent most of my career doing is cultural diplomacy, and that's how you use music and food and art and dance and culture to communicate your, your intangibles to foreign publics. I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. And the last aspect of public diplomacy, which I'm not going to really get into much today, is international broadcasting. So things like the BBC, Voice of America, uh, France 24, Deutsche Welle, Al Jazeera, these are government-sponsored um, broadcast outlets. So it's a little different than, you know, commercial outlets. You, you take the market out of the equation, and that, that matters in public diplomacy, but we're not going to get into that as much. So public diplomacy, one of the main facets of public diplomacy is dealing with a concept called soft power. Soft power is the power of your influence. So while hard power is how you get what you want out of force or coercion, soft power is how you use the power of your influence, the power of your resources, your institutions, uh, the power of your, the models and the attractiveness of your culture and your values to, to get, um, you know, currency in, in, be it in a communal sense, in an international sense. But soft power is really a, a facet of public diplomacy of how you connect with this. But what, what public diplomacy understands is you don't reach people through rational information, but rather through emotional transrational connections that come through these intangibles like music and food, art and dance and culture, and in advocacy in terms of storytelling, telling who you are as a country, as a community. And so I, I've been engaged in this for, for many years. I mean, uh, but what you have to understand, uh, so it was Gandhi who said, I have nothing new to offer. Truth and nonviolence are as old as the hills. Well, by the same token, you know, there's nothing new about communicating your, your culture, your history, you know, th this is pe what people have been doing since time, you know, immemorial. But what's new about this in a public diplomacy sense is thinking about it in a strategic sense, you know, how do you use this to enhance your soft power, enhance the, the, the standing of your community. There's a, a great professor uh, at, at USC where I got a master's in public diplomacy. Um, named Manuel Castells, and he really describes public diplomacy the best, I think. And what he says is, public diplomacy is the projection in the international arena of the values and the ideas of the public. The aim of the practice of public diplomacy is not to convince, but to communicate, not to declare, but to listen. Public diplomacy seeks to build a sphere in which diverse voices can be heard in spite of their various origins, distinct values, and often contradictory interests. So I've spent my career creating spaces in which different cultures can connect, most often through music. Uh, although interestingly, I have no musical background. I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't break dance, I would break something. Um, but I've been working on music programs, you know, playing a, my own role of basically being a public diplomacy Sherpa, dealing with the logistics, running the, the programs, making sure that you get these partners connecting. And I'll share a, a bit about this. Um, to understand me a little bit, uh, I wanted to share a little bit of my background. So I'm, I'm originally from Washington, D.C., and I you know, grew up uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, I went to a synagogue called Temple Micah, and I started studying for my bar mitzvah with the rabbi the day of the Rodney King riots. The day that the Rodney King riots broke out was the first day I started studying for my bar mitzvah. So social action in tikkun olam was something that was seared into my consciousness at a very young age and something that I've, I've been engaged in you know, my whole life through these, these programs and projects. After my bar mitzvah, I kind of dropped off a bit. I thought I might end up being a Buddhist by the time I was 20. I was, you know, it, it didn't quite fully connect with me. And then when I was 16, I went on a, a Young Judea Israel discovery trip. And that just, it blew my mind. I mean, talk about cultural exchange. I was, you know, visiting Israel for the first time, seeing this in, in such a tangible connection to my history and my heritage, reading the source in the desert, you know, all around. And it just, it completely changed my life and my perspective because my cultural background, my, my you know, my identity was something so real to me now with, with um, Israel and with, you know, my Jewish sense. So when I returned from that trip, I got involved with Young Judea, first on a local level, then on a regional level. I was a social action programmer for my region. Um, 
And, and I knew immediately I wanted to go to Brandeis. Brandeis was, you know, this was, this was where I wanted to be. Um, so after I applied and got into Brandeis uh, and was planning on going, I, you know, said to Brandeis, well, hold on one second, I'm, I'm, I want to do a, a gap year. Uh, I want to do Young Judea a year course. And they said, you know, Brandeis, of course, Brandeis guesses, but Brandeis said, bubble, of course, go for it. Um, so I took a, a year between high school and college and spent a year living in Israel on Young Judea a year course. And for me, it, it you know, gave me direction and purpose. It, it gave me a year to kind of grow up a bit and, and figure out what it was that I, I was interested in. By the time I came to Brandeis, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to study. I was so interested in the Middle East. I, I wanted to, to be engaged in, in learning more about this. And Brandeis said, Bubba, you came to the right place. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about some of the courses I took at Brandeis and how it's kind of shaped my direction and, and my thinking even today. I mean, I graduated over you know, almost 20 years ago and yet I still have so much that, that came from my Brandeis education that, that affects me today. Um, I got to Brandeis my freshman year, started taking classes on, you know, on the Middle East. I took a class on rise and decline of the Ottoman Empire with uh, Professor Avigdor Levy, and it just, it blew my mind. I mean, it was so fascinating to learn about this multi-ethnic, you know, multilingual um, Ottoman Empire of which the, the Jews found refuge there, uh, and learning of this history, it, it completely just changed my perspective of everything I knew. Um, also, the freshman year, I took a class on intro to IR with Professor Bob Art, and you need to get the basics if you're going to understand the international system. Um, I took this wonderful class on international systems on kind of an IR class, looking at diplomacy from Metternich onwards. I mean, just things that really only Brandeis can, can give you in terms of just the, the depth of, of understanding. I was taking history as well. I mean, excuse me, taking Hebrew as well. Um, my spring semester, I took a, a class, 20th Century Political Novels with Professor Whitfield. And I still have the, those novels behind me. I mean, we, we read you know, things that, that just shape your understanding of the world, things like Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, uh, Arthur Kessler's The Darkness at Noon, Jack London's The Iron Heel. And if, if you want to understand what's going on in the world right now, <laughs> read Jack London's The Iron Heel. Um, but just one of those things that only Brandeis can give you in terms of, of understanding you know, the world through political novels. Um, continue with the Middle East focus. I took a class on world of Shia Islam with Professor Yitzhak Nakash, and it was fascinating. Just getting to understand the, the nuance and the you know the the different directions of of the the Islamic world. Getting to see you know the the real differences. I mean, and Professor Nakash was a, a you know, brilliant scholar on on Shia Islam and learning just the differences and the you know, it, it really like one of those things that only Brandeis can give you. I took another class with a, a visiting professor named Professor Sadiq al-Azam, a class on Arab society and political thought. He was a visiting scholar from Damascus, just a brilliant fellow. He wrote um, one of the seminal works after the, the Six Day War called Self-Criticism After the Defeat, um, just looking at Arab society and culture after the Six Day War. And he, just a, a brilliant fellow. Thankfully, he got out of Syria um, you know, when the Syrian civil war hit. But uh, just again, understanding the Middle East in a way that only Brandeis can teach you. I took another class uh, that semester called Building a New Europe with Professor Ross. And this was you know, prescient because this was at the time where in, in Austria, the, the rise of the Freedom Party, this far right party. And I remember writing a paper about the, the specter of the far right nationalism in Europe and, and just tracking this early on. And you know, sadly, none of this has surprised me that's been going on because in part because we were looking at this at Brandeis all these years ago. And I took a, a class, something that, that still sticks with me, a writing seminar, uh, where one of the things that we read was The Minister's Black Veil by, by Hawthorne. And so here we are living in this COVID age, and this is, this is a great uh, you know, story of this minister who's wearing a, a black veil across his face and you know, how society treats him differently because he's got a mask on. Um, anyway, onward to sophomore year, taking class on Islamic civilizations and institutions, again with Levy. Took a phenomenal class on Tolstoy with Professor uh, Swenson who, you know, understanding how to, 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 to really pick up Tolstoy uh, onto Hebrew and all that into the spring, third world ideology of the Professor Ngoni, um, learning about Kwame Nkrumah, Ahmed Ben Bella, you know, things that later on when I was working in Africa was, you know, able to talk fluently about some of these Pan-African ideologies, you know, dating back to Brandeis really kind of helped shape my, my work. Um, Anyway, moving on, you know, classes like the Jerry Cohen in the 60s, 
um, you know, and, and being at Brandeis, you, you live in the library. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about BN, you know, BNC is because I lived in the library. Onward, you know, writing to taking a uh, class with Robert Reich, Wealth and Poverty, I mean, brilliant stuff. And writing op-eds in the justice, you know, this is during the, the Intifada, Second Intifada, and just beginning my chops. Um, I took my junior year abroad in Prague, and this was during 9-11, and, you know, just getting a sense of how the world was shaking apart, um, getting to explore Central and Eastern Europe, and, you know, Brand, I said, you okay out there? I said, absolutely, I'm fine, you know, uh, kind of kicked into my wanderlust. After that, uh, my spring semester, I was in Morocco, studying and living in Morocco, began studying Arabic, living with a Moroccan Muslim family, and how much that shaped my, my view of the world being there. On to my senior year at Brandeis, living in with a Turkish Jew, a Colombian Jew, a Russian Jew, all in our suite. We spoke nine languages. It really the quintessential Brandeis experience, um, true Tower of Babel. And, and socialization matters. I, I would later write a column for the Jerusalem Post called Tales of a Wandering Jew about Jewish communities in far-flung places. I'll get into that a little bit. But that, I would say, really came from my time at Brandeis. Um, Came back my senior year, as I said, and I was working for, uh, with a, an internship at the Israeli consulate, that, working in the press office. That would help lead on to um, a job with the Israeli foreign ministry. I'll get into that. But continuing with Brandeis, you know, Jews in the world of Islam, started taking Hebrew and Arabic back to back, learning, trying to study two languages at once, which is mind blowing, you know, speaking the wrong language in the wrong class and writing a thesis, what makes a suicide bomber tick. Um, and most importantly, I took a class, Global Civil Society, which began to understand how transnational advocacy networks connect within civil society, the communication of ideas internationally. Anyway, graduate from Brandeis with an Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies. I had a job out of college working as the press officer for the Consulate General of Israel to the Southwest. I was lucky enough to turn that consulate internship with the, the Israeli consulate into a job as the press officer. And so began my public diplomacy career down in, in Texas, in a shalom y'all, doing press and public diplomacy on behalf of the Israeli foreign ministry for a five state region, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico. This was doing press and media and public diplomacy work during the second intifada, the Gaza disengagement, you know, really difficult times, never easy times dealing with, um, you know, Israeli public diplomacy, but, you know, this was, also getting to understand how do you promote Israel beyond the conflict, you know, showing sides of its democracy, its diversity, its development. And really, this is where I began working on cultural diplomacy. You know, we would do programs like sharing Druze poetry or Ethiopian Israeli storytellers. We had a, a Latino affairs officer named Sophia Purchase, and she was the first um, uh, Latino affairs officer for the Israeli consulate. We would do outreach in Spanish to the Southwest region, um, doing smart programs like we did uh, for Day of the Dead, Dia de, Muerto, Dia de Muertos. We built an ofrenda for the first um, Mexican ambassador to Israel, Octavio Paz, the famous poet, and got pictures from the Israeli foreign ministry. And again, back to the, uh, the idea of listening, knowing how to, to connect with your audience. So I spent about three years uh, in Houston doing Israeli media and public diplomacy, as I mentioned, during the Second Intifada and the Gaza disengagement. Towards the end of my, my tenure there, I happened to be reading a, a New York Times article, and there was a, a piece by Dennis Ross, the, the great you know, uh, peace negotiator. And he wrote this piece about how it's not quite applicable, but Israelis and Palestinians could learn, well, this is what he said, is Israelis and Palestinians could learn from the model of South African reconciliation. So the, the situation's not applicable, but the, the model of reconciliation was something that they could work on. The next day I saw a, a, a um, advertisement in the, the Jewish Herald Voice, the local Jewish newspaper, about a, a rotary exchange in South Africa. And so I wrote them you know, an application for this rotary exchange saying, I, I work with Israelis and Palestinians and I would love to, to see more of this model of reconciliation. And so I moved on from my work with the Israeli consulate and I had this rotary exchange in South Africa. And this is really where I got to see cultural exchange first and foremost. I was traveling through the, the Eastern Cape, the Free State and Lesotho, staying with Rotarian families, getting to see um, you know, parts of the country that you don't usually go to. Everyone goes to Cape Town and Joburg. This was getting to see a different sense of it. And this is when I started writing columns for the Jerusalem Post because I began looking at the Jewish community in the hinterlands of South Africa. We know about you know, the Jewish community in Cape Town. This was writing a column about 
what had been uh, what's called a smouse. Um, this was an itinerant merchant peddler who was the, the lifeblood of the hinterlands of South Africa, doing all of the, the trading and, and really bringing all of the, um, the wares you know, from place to place. And so that began my career as a journalist, uh, writing about Jewish communities in far-flung places. After that, I worked at a camp called Seeds of Peace, as I mentioned, this Campo conflict where you get Israeli, Palestinian, Egyptian, Jordanian, Indian, and Pakistani teenagers. You get them together for the summer. And the first night, Israelis can't sleep because there's Palestinians in their bunk. Palestinians can't sleep because there's Israelis in their bunk. Same with the Indians and Pakistanis. And you get them together, breaking down barriers by living together, playing sports together, having dialogue, really getting to connect. And they don't always end up being best friends, but the people that they thought were monsters, they learn are no different than they are. And this is, this is the power of cultural exchange and cultural diplomacy and something that I've always taken with me. Um, as I mentioned, I, I was a journalist. I continued on traveling from Beijing to Cairo, writing about Jewish communities in far-flung places. Um, you know, something that came out of my work at Brandeis of understanding that the Jewish community worldwide is something so vast and profound and there's so many stories to tell. So writing about communities growing leaps and bounds like the Jewish community of Beijing or the Jewish community of Shanghai, writing about communities that are in the twilight of their days in, um, in India and Cochin. And I also wrote, a, I was the first Jerusalem Post columnist to write about being a Jew in Pakistan. Um, and that would later, you know, turn into some uh, projects that I worked on on what was called the Pakistan-Israel Peace Forum, connecting Pakistanis and Israelis and their diasporas um, through dialogue. Again, connecting people through public diplomacy. Anyway, onward to um, some more work on the Pakistan-Israel front with a Professor Maoz, who I worked with at Brandeis, on the behind-the-scenes Pakistan-Israel connections. There's actually a, a long history of relations between Pakistan and Israel, but behind the scenes, not official, but um, you know, uh, it's a longer story. I don't have time to get into all of that. Anyway, I continue my peripateticness. I was in, living in Buenos Aires. Uh, I had a fellowship in Uruguay called the Nakam Goldman Fellowship for Young Jewish Leadership from all around the world. You know, young Jewish Leadership from Israel, India, uh, Argentina, France, you know, again, connecting the Jewish world in, in dialogue. After my time there, I went to USC to get a master's in public diplomacy and really took a deeper dive into public diplomacy, you know, looking at things like gastro diplomacy, how countries communicate their culture through their food, um, you know, the, the cultural diplomacy stuff. I mentioned I worked in Taiwan and in India with their, their um, foreign ministries looking at in Taiwan about how Taiwan uses its public diplomacy to get around its diplomatic difficulties looking at how India can communicate, you know, ideas of, of nonviolence, uh, but really, you know, continuing to build a space in which different cultures can connect. So this all leads me up to what has been the last seven years where I was working on State Department cultural diplomacy programs. I, um, I ended up, once I got back from India, working for an organization called American Voices. I was the communications director, and American Voices does two things. It runs performing arts academies in countries in conflict. So I ran a performing arts academy in Iraq, teaching jazz and breakdance and symphony and theater, teaching um, a music composition program. So this, this academy in, in Iraq was for the youth orchestras of Kurdistan, the youth orchestra of Iraq, teaching the next generation of cultural leadership in pedagogy and, and musical skills, um, really you know, just helping to, to build the next generation of cultural leadership. And we had this fascinating music composition program where they were taking theories of Western musical composition and applying it to Kurdish and Arabic music. And the, these music students were writing their own symphonies, the Baghdad Waltz and all sorts of wonderful things. And those performed by these youth orchestras. And being a Jew in Iraq, I got to be an ambassador. I mean, I literally, you know, there's not a lot of Jews who end up in Iraq these days. And I, I never hid my identity. I would, you know, I. One time my, my Jewish star fell out and this girl looks at it and says, you're Jewish? I said, yeah, no, I'm I speak some Arabic. And she starts counting to 10 in, in Hebrew. And I start counting with her in Arabic and we get to 10 and she says, mashallah. Um, I, have a, I wrote a, a column called uh, Fiddler on the Roof in Kurdistan, which is a, a fun story. But there's a little anecdote from that of this guy Omar I met. Uh, and when he found out my la I was Jewish, he said, wait a minute, I thought all you Jews were named Stein, Stein, Stein. So being a Jew in, in foreign places, you get to also be an ambassador. Anyway, 
the other thing that uh, American Voices does is it runs the American Music Abroad program. So the American Music Abroad program is the evolution of the Jazz Ambassadors program. Jazz Ambassadors was the, the State Department program that sent Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Dave Brubeck, all around the world to be cultural ambassadors. I mean, one of the, the secrets is that the US won the Cold War with jazz. It's, it was, there's a great book on it called Satchmo Blows Up the World, but jazz was really the, the currency of cultural diplomacy for many, many years. And this program was the evolution of that. It was open to blues and bluegrass and Hawaiian music and hip hop and rock and roll. I would take trios of quartets, quintets, what have you. Uh, and would show a side of American culture that's not always known. So I took a, a five-girl bluegrass band named Della May to Central Asia, Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan, you know, bluegrass on the Silk Road. Um, and just, you know, the, the, this amazing part of the world that, that, one, there's not a lot of bluegrass that goes there. And this is the, the point of cultural diplomacy is it takes the market out of the equation. The reason why you can send, you know, Hawaiian music to Brazil or bluegrass to Uzbekistan is because this, these are in educational endeavors. You don't have the, the government supporting this. I mean, you don't have the, the market supporting this. So the government is able to, to use it as a, a cultural, um, showing a different side of American culture. I took, a, if you've ever seen the movie, The Descendants, uh, most of that music was done by a Hawaiian slacky guitar legend named Keola Beamer, Wanalani Beamer, his wife, uh, who's a Kumu Hula, Master Hula, and his protege. I took them to Brazil. I have to tell you, one of the most beautiful things in the world is teaching Brazilians to hula dance. There's you know, teaching people who dance like the waves to dance like the waves. It's, it's truly a beautiful thing. Uh, after a couple of years of working with American Voices, I went off on my own and started my own public diplomacy business called Levantine Public Diplomacy, where I was working with, um, with alumni from the State Department programs, connecting them with new embassies, with different embassies. So I took that Five Girl Bluegrass Band, Della May, took them to the Brazil for the World Cup, you know, sharing bluegrass, and I sent a rock and blues band to the north of Brazil, where there was, you know, they were connecting with uh, roots and rock and reggae with uh, the Northern Brazilian, you know, Afro-Brazilian music. Um, I took that Hawaiian slacky guitar group uh, to Zimbabwe, you know, where connecting the spirit of aloha with the spirit of Ubuntu. I mean, really just showing different sides of American culture all over. Uh, and that became about a third of my work. And then two thirds of my work, I was running the State Department's hip hop diplomacy program through the State Department and the University of North Carolina's music department. And that's a, you know, hip hop diplomacy is, is the evolution of jazz diplomacy. I mean, hip hop is, there's a difference between the cultural diplomacy that I was doing with the blues and the bluegrass and, and then with hip hop, because we were working with local hip hop communities where you had this epistemic, you know, dialogue between hip hop artists from the US, hip hop artists from Bangladesh, from Tunisia, Algeria, what have you. Um, we would take teams of MCs, DJs, beat makers, and break dancers to run hip hop academies all over the world using hip hop as a tool for social empowerment. And this was a, a we weren't working with beginning artists and not the most established artists, but kind of up and coming artists and building them a platform to get their music out further and how to use your music for um, entrepreneurship, social activism, conflict resolution. Um, and what you have to understand is hip hop is, is modern poetry. It's, it's called street journalism. It's a form of verbal and nonverbal communication that um, really, you know, is, is a way that connects. And these were hip hop communities communicating with each other. So building that space. And one of the things that we did in these programs is that we would also mix hip hop with traditional music wherever we were working. So in Algeria, mixing hip hop with Ganawi music. We're in El Salvador, mixing hip hop with cumbia. And it's just, you know, pushing the boundaries of what is hip hop. And, and the, the beauty of, of hip hop is that I worked in some of the, the worst gang violent, you know, areas of gang violence in El Salvador and working with some really tough people. And if you would ask them to talk about their experience, you wouldn't get a word out of them, but you give people a microphone and a beat and they can come alive and share what they've been dealing with and what they engage in. Um, in ways that you just, you don't get. So that was the, the other two thirds of my work, traveling all over, running these hip hop academies, doing hip hop diplomacy work. Everything was going smashingly well. I was traveling the world. I was running these fascinating programs. And then there was a little election in 2016. And I woke up to headlines. In, I was in Germany at the time. And I woke up to headlines in German of an unexpected outcome. And the day after the election, I was in Nuremberg, walking through the parade grounds that I'm sure many people recognize. Um, you know, and the, the day after that, I was in Weimar, the, the home of 
you know, Goethe and Schiller of German culture and the German, you know, the, the Weimar Republic. And just outside of Weimar, there's the Buchenwald concentration camp. And uh, it's just this juxtaposition. And from, from Weimar onto Leipzig, where the, the people of Leipzig helped bring down the East German communist state using music and, and culture to protest against the East German um, communist state. And on my way back to Prague, where I had been studying during 9-11. And I, I knew then that I wasn't going to continue my cultural diplomacy work with the State Department. I told all my clients I was discontinuing my work. And I was finishing out my final programs in Algeria and Tunisia. And I, I went off into exile in Morocco. I was a public diplomacy ronin, if you will. I took a little sabbatical, was, you know, was thinking about teaching public diplomacy. I was in Chefchaouen, this beautiful city uh, of all blue, where Jews had fled uh, the Inquisition and had ended up there and painted their houses blue. And over the years, the whole city painted itself blue. Um, and during that period was when we had Charlottesville. And seeing Nazis marching through the streets of, of Charlottesville, I, you know, it, it said something off of me. I said, I, I got to go back. You know, La Mancha's on fire. I can't, I, I can't stay out in here while, while you know, my own home country, my own home community is being threatened. So I worked my way back to the States, you know, off, all about trying to figure out how I could get best involved again. I found a, a job with the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Phoenix. I, I had known the work of the JCRCs when I worked for the Israeli Foreign Ministry, when I worked at the consulate in Houston. My best partners in the field were the JCRCs. The, you know, the, I would get an Ethiopian Israeli speaker, I'd send them to the JCRC in New Orleans, he would go set them up with a Baptist church. So I knew that this was the kind of practitioner public diplomacy work that I loved. So that's what brought me to, to Phoenix 18 months ago, and I've been here since. What we do here, internally within the Jewish community, we try and work to make a more cohesive, collaborative Jewish community. I, we, we do the, the, the crisis communications for the Jewish community, rapid response. We're kind of the press office for the Jewish community here in Phoenix. Externally, we do advocacy, interfaith outreach, and community bridge building on behalf of the Jewish community. We help communicate the issues that keep the Jewish community up at night to other communities around us, and we help the Jewish community understand what are the issues that keep other communities up at night. So helping them understand, you know, the anti-Semitism that we're facing, the, the, the dealing with these, these issues, and using the soft power of the Jewish community, the resources and institutions to help strengthen civil society. You know, there are, we deal with insecurity here. We have, um, you know, and helping other communities through our resources and institutions to become more secure as well. We, we work on issues of asylum, the asylum issues here in, in Arizona. We work on issues of criminal justice reform. Um, you know, Arizona's got a tremendous problem with criminal justice reform. And we, you know, we help fight Islamophobia. We help fight anti-Semitism and bigotry. Uh, and, and what we do is we take some of this communal public diplomacy down to the local level. So we hosted a concert where we had um, Jewish spiritual and gospel music. You know, we had a thousand people at a church, half Jewish, half African American, you know, listening to, to gospel and, Afri and, and Jewish spiritual music, bringing these communities together through these intangibles. Um, one of the things we've been working on here during COVID is helping stand up to some of the bigotry that the Chinese community has been facing, you know, really getting out in front and, and standing with them and, and putting, um, you know, uh, our foot down saying, you know, this is, we support the Chinese community, but things like this come back to us because, because of our work helping to support the Chinese community, when we were looking for PPE equipment, Chinese community said, you know, we, we've got all the, the source for this, we, we can help you. So this is the type of, you know, public diplomacy that, that really comes around and helps protect and safeguard the Jewish community. So I'm getting to the end of my time here. I'm gonna end with um, something that a very astute Israeli ambassador impressed upon me, and that is always have a clear message for your audience to take away. Um, what I would say is this, support institutions like Brandeis and BNC that are helping educate the next generation of, of communal leadership, of Jewish communal leadership, of, you know, of community leadership. This, this stuff's important, Lador Vador. This is, you know, if more people in the world had a Brandeis education, the world would be a better place. Dafka. Um, support those who are doing community relations and communal public diplomacy in your communities. Those who are on the front lines doing tikkun olam every day. And that's, that's across the field. I mean, there's, you know, there are a lot of people working in the trenches right now trying to make this community, make this world a better place. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end with uh, something that has stuck with me in all of my travels. 
כל העולם כולו גשר צר מאוד, והעיקר לא לפחד בכלל. The whole world is a narrow bridge, and when you travel to 85 countries, you know this, uh, but you mustn't be afraid to cross it. So thank you. I'm open to any questions, and I will take some questions from there. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So while we wait for a couple more people to write in some questions, I can start us off with one here. Do you believe that the reputation and perception of the United States in recent years will affect the ability of students and young adults of the next generation to connect through cultural exchange? That's a very good question. It depends. It depends on how we, it depends on, on a few things moving forward, like what happens in November, um, if this is seen as, you know, because during the, the, the reputation of the US was a bit low after the Bush years and, and there was, um, uh, Obama, you know, really changed that and the, the soft power of the US was on the rise again and then it kind of fell off the table a bit uh, in these last few years. I think if America is more engaged in the world again, then um, that will help all parties. I mean, I can remember when traveling be during the Bush years and people say, oh, American, Bush, and you know, it's, uh, I'm not, you know, I didn't. but when traveling during the Obama years, especially when it was first elected, people say, oh, Obama. I think things change. It just depends on our engagement with the world. And if we can be good cultural ambassadors, good cultural citizens, show that we can listen, show that we, we understand that. It's a good question. It really depends on our behavior. And we, if we can be more engaged, I think, I mean, every American needs to go abroad and see a little bit more of how the world is, you know, and the more we are engaged, the more uh, cultural exchange takes place, the better off we all are. But that's a good question. Thank you. And here's another one. Uh, could you share with us how ideology intertwines with public diplomacy strategies? Any imposement of slash pitfalls of your values, traditions, ways of life to other cultures? That's a good question. Um, so especially with the work, we, like with the, the hip hop diplomacy, we, we made a very good point of telling the artists we worked with, you know, you you, you represent your community, but you're not going to these countries saying, we're from America, we're from the birthplace of hip hop. You're going to, to share who you are and learn who they are. You know, again, it, it's about the, the listening in, involved in this. I mean, I think that's one of the beauties of, of artists is artists are better listeners in some ways because they're dealing with music. Um, you know, the, 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 the question of ideology, with all of the public diplomacy programs that I ran with the, the cultural diplomacy, there was, we kept the politics out of it. This was about creating a space for people to connect through culture. And so there really, very rarely did we ever deal with any of the political issues directly. Um, you know, and, and so we really kept ideology out of it. You know, and, and I think in some ways it's, it's easier having partners who, who run this. So that I was working for UN, University of North Carolina's music department, that made us a, a bit different than if we were working directly with the State Department because we were managing the program, but we could kind of fence it off the program a bit and make it really about the people to people connections. So you work hard in public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy to keep the, the politics out of it and really connect, you know, on that, that intangible level of uh, through, through the arts themselves. So here's a good question. I'm going to combine two here. So the first question that came in was, what advice do you have for an incoming freshman to Brandeis? for someone whose daughter is going to be attending this fall. And then there was another comment about, do you have any advice for recent 2020 graduates, uh, particularly those navigating towards work in public diplomacy? Oh, two very good questions. Um, for the one who's, I'll start with the, the freshman coming in. Um, make sure you take a junior year abroad, I would say. You know, the, that'll open up your, your mind in ways that you, you can't even imagine. Um, you know, it depends on what you're interested in. If, if you're interested, you know, if you're going to Brandeis, the, the, the Nedges Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies are phenomenal. There's so much to learn there and you, know, you start that way. For those who've just graduated, it's a tough time. I am sorry for you graduates. Oh, I can't imagine. I mean, it's never easy to graduate, but it, the world is so topsy-turvy right now. It's hard to say. What I would say is that there are, you know, in years past, I would have said, look at the Peace Corps, look at NGOs and nonprofits working in, in spaces, look at Teaching English. Rotary Foundation has a lot of um, programs, but if you wanna get out in the world and, and be involved in public diplomacy, you, you gotta be, I, I think it helps to start as a practitioner, um, you know, and, and to do that, you have to be involved in, you have to get some, 
some experience in this and experience in the world, be it teaching English abroad, be it, you know, volunteering for an NGO somewhere, but you got to start somewhere. You got to get some experience behind you in the world and being engaged in it and understanding how the world works. Um, we'll see when we can travel again. I mean, that's kind of the X factor in all of this. If you're interested, but whoever the, the person who asked about public diplomacy, I'd say um, let's connect offline and I'll, I'll give you some, I'm happy to try, chat more about careers in public diplomacy. That's a kind of a longer conversation. Uh, I'm glad to, to speak with anybody who's interested in that. But to the, the freshmen, uh, start thinking about your junior year abroad now and, and where you wanna go and think about languages and, and look at scholar, I mean, there's like the, there's something called the FLAS scholarship, which is a critical language scholarship. And it's a tremendous scholarship if you wanna, uh, if you wanna be focused on languages. And, and I would say, work on your languages. The more languages you speak, the better off you are. As I said, I speak varying degrees of about nine languages now. I'm using my time in quarantine to learn Portuguese. Um, yeah, it's just something I'm, I'm doing now, but, but the more languages you speak, the more the world opens up to you. And I'd say that for you know, the, the recent grads and the, for the people who are just starting out in college. I have a couple questions that I'll combine again about the U.S. State Department. Uh, one was more about uh, how, is, how has your work involved you with the U.S. State Department and how do you see the department changing? And then a more detailed question that says, as we've seen more recently, general American diplomacy and the role of the State Department has been severely undermined through this administration. Have you seen public diplomacy undermined to the same extent, or do you think it's played a much uh, bigger role than ever before? Okay, uh, good question. So we're gonna take the, the first one about where public diplomacy is at now. Um, well, during COVID, nothing is going on right now. With, are there people trying to figure out how to do public and cultural diplomacy online. I, I'm, you know, working with some of the artists who are not working with them now, but reading proposals for how you can engage in cultural diplomacy. The embassies are still trying to do it. Um, even, be, you know, I left in 2016 with my work with the State Department. The budgets were being cut. The programs that I worked on still exist and they're still going on and they're trying to figure out how to, to deal with it in the COVID reality. But a lot of the, the direct funding that embassies had for programs was beginning to diminish. Um, you know, it, it, public diplomacy, it matters, you know, I, I will say like, it, it depends on the, the government in place. The Bush administration actually got public diplomacy well, and they did a lot to, to support public diplomacy, which is, sounds kind of, you know, strange to hear, but they, they understood that. Um, the Obama administration did a lot of public diplomacy as well. You know, the, the public diplomacy is kind of a bit away from the, the side of diplomacy, and so it, it can still, function and work and still engage with people in, in ways it's, it's even more necessary right now. Um, you know, we're talking about kind of pre-COVID, but more necessary as, as relations, you know, as political relations are, are diminished, trying to maintain the people to people contacts is even more important. Remind me the first part of the question. The first part of the question, sorry, I'm just pulling it up. Um, have you seen public diplomacy undermined to the same extent? Yeah, it was, um, you know, the, the budget for, as I mentioned, the, the, the public diplomacy budgets, you know, were still there, but not as much as it had been. Um, you had the, some undersecretaries for public diplomacy who I don't think really ever understood public diplomacy. Um, yeah, you know, all of diplomacy, including public diplomacy, has been undermined the last few years. Uh, that's the reality. And it's, it's unfortunate. Um, we'll see if things change, you know things can rebound. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Here's another one. Uh, do you think that the current administration has permanently damaged relations with other countries? If not, what changes would future U.S. presidents need to implement to repair these relationships? So I don't think there have been permanent damage quite yet, but we, you know, it depends. If, if we have another four years of this, then yeah, you will probably see some permanent damage. Again, the you know the relations weren't always great during the Bush years weren't as bad as they are now but it will you know during the Obama years things rebounded quite a bit I think uh, a new administration that is listening and is more engaged with the world will will change things um, so yeah I do, I don't think anything is permanent you know um, but we we're at a real you know crossroads and depending on which way we go will we'll affect our reputation, our soft power, our, our ability to engage with the world for years to come. Um, that's, you know, that's the reality that we're dealing with. And so I don't think, I don't think any, I don't think there's been a permanent rupture, but we're, we're going to have to do a lot of, a lot of public diplomacy work, uh, you know, moving forward to kind of fix the, the damage that's been done. There's been some real damage done. 
I have another one. How has public diplomacy work shifted and adjusted given the pandemic? Well, it's hard. I mean, you, you don't have the people to people. You don't have people to people engagement. You don't have cultural diplomacy programs taking place. You know, I mean, cultural di public diplomacy is about the last three feet. That's what the, the doyen of public diplomacy, Edward R. Morrow, said is it's, it's really about the last three feet of connecting people. And that's what, you know, that's what I, I spend years doing is building these spaces in which people can connect, you know, personally. You can't do that in COVID because I, I'm in my, you know, I'm here talking to all of you rather than just, uh, you know, because we're stuck inside. I mean, we're on Zoom. You, you can't connect the same way. You can't carry out the same public diplomacy. I mean, there's parts of public diplomacy that like the advocacy that's still going on, the international broadcasting is still going on, but the, the real bread and butter of, of public diplomacy is cultural diplomacy and cultural exchange. And that's not taking place right now. Um, you know, and we'll have to see where that goes in the future when we can actually get out again and, and be connecting. But it's gonna be a while, I think, before that stuff really comes back. Although, as I said, I'm starting to see some of the artists that I worked with putting together proposals for how do you do cultural diplomacy online, how do you use Zoom diplomacy, I guess, will probably be a thing soon. Um, so it'll, it'll shift, but that's, that's kind of where we're at. And another one asking, have, have you done any work with Musicians Without Borders? Which I have not, but I'm familiar with that, that program, and the, that's great work. Um, yeah, no, there, there's a lot of good stuff with that. There's, there's a lot of good ways of, of connecting musicians around the world. Um, you know, the, the State Department stuff is what, what I love to do, and, and you know, I, I haven't been involved with the kind of the NGO side of things uh, in that regard, but there, there's, yeah, Musicians Without Borders is phenomenal. Yo Yo Ma does a lot of cultural diplomacy work. There's, there's a lot still out there, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. And here's a question about the era of globalization and whether or not you think this era has somewhat ended or deteriorated in the last decade or two, do you see a resurgence of globalization in a post-COVID world? Good question. Um, I think so. I hope so. You know, we, I mean, look, the, there was the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, and yet after that was done, you saw, you know, the world kind of globalizing again, and it fits and starts because you had World War II. But, you know, once, once COVID, once we have COVID under control, God willing, inshallah, bizrat Hashem, like, you know, then we can begin to engage again. But I, I don't think, I don't think globalization will go away. I, I, I'm hopeful that, that COVID will not be permanent, that we will find a way of getting some handle on this someday. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I, you know, I can't speak to that. Um, but I, I'm optimistic that the world will open itself back up and reconnect further. You know, it's, it's who we are. It's how we, we engage and there's too much that that we we need from each other in this world i mean uh, to to see this you know to see us stay i mean we don't like being isolated nobody likes being isolated nobody likes being home all the time on zoom you know you want to be out connecting with people you want to be a, i'd love to go back to a concert i you know we can't do that now but i'm optimistic that globalization once we're we're able to will continue i don't think you can stop globalization you know i, I think there are administrations that would like to, but you can't do that. You can't shut yourself off from the world. Um, so I, I'm optimistic that we, you know, when, when this too shall pass, we will be able to, to reconnect with the world. The world will reconnect itself. So. I'll give you one final question here that's been submitted. How do you have a personal home life while traveling all over the world? <laughs> Uh, I didn't. I lived out of a backpack. I had a, a day pack and I had, that was my, my home and I had a backpack with my computer and my scanner and I literally, I, I didn't have a fixed address for seven years. I traveled, you know, I would spend two months studying French in, in Tours or Nice and then I'd uh, go run a program in, you know, in Bangladesh and then I'd come back and I'd go run a program in climbing. Some years I was in, I was running programs in Central and South America. Some years it was in, across Africa, but uh, my home life was the road and, and I lived on the road and uh, I really enjoyed that, that life, you know, of picking up all the time. Um, now I'm settled, I'm, I'm here, you know, working uh, on behalf, you know, doing this kind of communal public diplomacy. I've really enjoyed taking the, the, these ideas of public diplomacy and distilling them down to a communal level and figuring out, knowing that these, these skills that, that I, I've, you know, had over the years in an international context work in a domestic context as well. So this is my first real stint in a long time at, at having some kind of, you know, home life. Um, but, you know, as you can imagine, I, I'm not married. I, I do not have any kids. That made my travels much easier. And so be it. You know, I, it's the choices you make. I, I, 
I enjoyed being itinerant for many, many, many years. I mean, literally bouncing continent hopping and country hopping. I mean, again, some years I was in 25 countries. And yet this year I've been to one country. I went to Mexico for my birthday, like in January. And I don't think I'm going to get out of this country again. And that for me is strange, but that's where we are in the world these days. So you, you, you figure out how to take the, you know, I have a, a spice cabinet full of spices from Zanzibar in India. And so I, I, these days I travel through my, my cooking. I travel through the record collection I got and you know, all sorts of fun music that I picked up around the world. Um, and so that's how I engage with the world these days is you know, through the music that I have and the food that I have. But you know, I, I look forward to getting back into the world. Well, thank you, Paul. I think Linda's gonna jump on and say a few closing words. Hi, Paul, that was fantastic. I'm exhausted from your travels and it was, it was fantastic. It was a really, it's an amazing life you've lived and it doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody. It's been an incredible opportunity that you've had between countries and languages and just uh, opportunities to meet so many different people from all over the world. It's fantastic. And I thank you very, very much for being a part of it. And I thank everybody here that's joined us. Um, we appreciate all your questions and you joining us. Um, I want to thank Alex and, and Adela for, and Brandeis and Beth Bernstein for um, offering us this opportunity. And uh, please, if you, uh, I've requested that you um, set, give everybody your email. We've been asked by a few people. Can you yes. please? Yeah. Uh, I can, I'll type it in the, um, let's see. I'm going to put my email, my personal email in the chat and Please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to give advice on public diplomacy, public diplomacy careers. Um, one thing we couldn't do on this was to share some of the, the videos and the music. We couldn't quite get the, the tech working, but I've got a, a lot of fun videos of hip hop freestyles and Shona and Ndebele and Bangla and, and music from around the world of, you know, Delamade, this five girl bluegrass band singing in Urdu. Um, you know, so please feel free to connect and I'm, I'm happy to share some of the, these, you know, the, these examples of the work. But thank thank you. you so, so much. I, really, as I said, it's been what an amazing opportunity to, to have this experience. And thank you, Brandeis, for your beginning, right? No, thank you. Like, I, I, again, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Brandeis education I received. I wouldn't have had an open, such an open view of the world if it wasn't for the socialization of Brandeis and, and understanding how vast and varied the Jewish world is. So I, I thank Brandeis and I thank you for having me. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share this. So thank well, you thank all. Thank you. Thank you and have a very nice day, everybody.